Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It is uh, what a tremendous honor uh, to be here as always. A privilege to be able to preach. What a building. I tell you what, when uh, we came in here Monday night, it's like, whoa. We had, uh, you know, I would, uh, Pastor Greg would send pictures and videos and things like that, but to walk in here and see this, you know, we, uh, we used to rent buildings like this. Amen. We own this one. Hallelujah. This is a miracle. And, um, and it kind of goes along with what I'm saying. What great preaching uh, we've had this week and Pastor Lamb this morning and uh, Pastor Skytema and just tremendous. We really thank God uh, for the ministry. Acts 15, we'll go there in the Word of God. Uh, uh, I probably have been thinking about some of these things for a while, but the real inspiration uh, came, uh, we were in the Tucson conference only about three weeks ago, and while I was in the conference, I had an epiphany, a revelation, uh, and uh, one of those epiphanies are like, you know, re uh, the big revelation, and so uh, I want to tell you about it. It happened during an excellent sermon preached by Eric Strutz. Uh, Eric was preaching, it was early on in his sermon, and there might have been that morning about 1,600 people or so there in the morning seminars. And Eric said, if you are 50 years of age or younger, I want you to stand to your feet. Now, reflexively, I wanted to stand up until I remembered I'm 56. <laughs> and what was interesting is, I, I may be wrong, but it seemed like 80% of the people stood up. Me and Marty Carnegie and a few others sat, remained looking at each other. And, uh, and, and I just, and I thought about that, and then they sat down, and then Eric went on to say that uh, most of the men that are preaching here are grandfathers. That's me. And uh, in fact, last week, my daughter had a, a second son, Hudson, and so we're very grateful for that. But, but uh, my, hold on, my revelation, though, was that I'm old. And uh, <laughs> that was like, like, I'm old. You know, what, what happened here? I'm not used to being old. I got saved when I was 16. My wife and I got married at 19 and sent out at 21 and uh, kind of always used to being young, but I'm not young anymore. The reality is that much of our fellowship is young. And that day when I was looking out there, I was looking and I was looking at all those young pastors that God is raising up in our fellowship. Our generation has gone from Pink Floyd to Pink Funk. We, are, uh, we have experienced a, a change. Now, I want you to think with me about this because this means something. 2,600 churches, 125 nations of the world means that we have a very diverse fellowship. We have people here that have uh, 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 diverse nationalities, ethnically diverse, racially diverse. The language, if you've ever been to the Dutch conference, it's like the United Nations with all the translators that are back there. Not only that, we are uh, diverse because we have churches in many of the great cities of the world like London and Mexico City, um, large metropolitan areas. Um, and so we have urban pastors um, and then we have churches that are in smaller communities that are rural. Um, and, and the reality is that when you look at this fellowship, um, uh, there's a tremendous amount um, of difference, uh, especially now, as we approach our 50-year mark in January, generationally, that there is a diversity. The reality is this uh, a morning, many of us that went out to pastor went out in the 70s and the early 80s uh, and uh, in the early days of our fellowship. Uh, and uh, today we have a whole generation, uh, don't get offended, but that we could call them millennial pastors. Not that you're a millennial, but you've been raised in the ministry in this millennium. I want to tell you that's a wonderful thing and it's an exciting thing, but it comes with its own unique set of challenges. It's interesting, I, I came across a little fact about Mexico that the break that began with the, uh, uh, Mexico from Spain, which had planted the governments that were there uh, with Cortez and all of that, that it came with Cortez's grandson was the first time that they began to say that the people over there don't understand what we're going through over here. 
The work that they're doing there and the way they do things is great over there, but the way they do things over there doesn't necessarily work here or in this generation. I want to go back to the first Bible conference this morning. Now, the first Bible conference in our fellowship, I believe, was 1975. I want to go back about maybe 1,900 years earlier to the actual first Bible conference in 50 A.D. Because you will find that as they gathered together, workers gathered together, they had to begin to think through these issues about who we are and about what are we passing on to the next generation and whether or not those who are going to carry the torch are going to stay true to what God did. I want to preach a sermon called Hands On, Acts 15, verse 23, and we're just going to read the letter that was written out of that Bible conference. It says, they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report of the same things by the word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. Verse 30 says, So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Verse 31, when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Father, help us this morning. We are so grateful for what you have done that we would be faithful and steward this to another generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Number one, we must be willing to let go. Now, I want you to consider our text this morning because here we have the first Bible conference. Uh, this takes place around 17 years after the day of Pentecost. Uh, what has happened is the workers have returned. Uh, and you might have guessed the theme of that Bible conference would have been regions beyond or the Gentile question. What has taken place uh, is that in the last few years, God has powerfully moved uh, among the Gentile community. If you were to read Acts 15, you'll find that one night uh, during the conference, uh, Peter came and gave his testimony, um, and he began to talk about going to Cornelius' house um, and they being filled uh, with the Holy Ghost. And maybe it was the next night that Paul got up um, and said, I'm Paul and I'm uh, pastoring in the city of Antioch. Um, and he began to share about the powerful revival there and the other cities that Paul visited, um, and that revival was breaking out uh, among Gentiles. Now, they're in Jerusalem. They're in the mother church, uh, and they're sharing about this move of God. Uh, and you could imagine the crowd cheering uh, and hearing the glorious reports of what God is doing, particularly uh, in reaching um, this people group. Uh, but not everybody there uh, was happy. Acts 15.1 says, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. You know, I hate to say it, beloved, but there are a lot of people, or there are some people who still don't see what God is doing. They don't get it, they don't see it, um, and that was the very reason why they have that conference in the first place. The whole idea behind gathering together, uh, well, you know, this is wonderful, but how many know we're not here for a pep rally this week? We are here to be on the same page. We are here to hear what our leaders are saying to us and what God is saying through them uh, so that every one of us walk out of here the way they walked out of that Bible conference, knowing the will of God. And that is why, by the way, you ought to come to conference. Because this is where uh, this takes place. Um, and, and what's interesting here, I want you to consider, first of all, is that there, there was a need to make judgments. They gathered together to render a verdict, to think through the issues uh, and walk away knowing what God's will is. Uh, in that day, the issue is, what do we do with these Gentiles who are getting saved? 
Does a pagan have to be converted to be a Jew before he can be converted to be a Christian? And so my, the answer to all my Jewish roots friends is absolutely not. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Christian. Amen. In fact, I could get in the way of things, actually, if you ask my opinion. The reality was here that they didn't need to do this. In verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. In other words, they said, all right, uh, we are going to pass this on, uh, and we have to figure out what we are passing on uh, and what we don't pass on and what is unnecessary or, in fact, even burdensome. The church has to make these decisions. The apostle, the apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 said, Test all things and hold fast what is good. A healthy, growing, balanced ministry does this. They understand that everything we do has to be proven. It has to be tested. Uh, and uh, if it is valuable and it is worthwhile, we hang on to it. Uh, it if it's uh, not necessary or if it has become uh, 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 useless uh, or uh, unnecessary, then it is time to set it uh, behind. Um, because if we're not careful, we will find ourselves doing a lot of useless things, uh, or as Pastor Mitchell calls it, religious activity. There has to be this understanding. The requirement uh, that Jews or Jewish converts can become Christian was tested um, and set aside. Um, and the reality is that this is a healthy way of living for God and leading uh, and pastoring churches. We render judgments all the time. The minutes, you know, people say, well, you know, I want to go to a church where there's no judgment. Well, they're going to work here because we do judge things here. For example, the Bible says, um, 1 Corinthians 14, 21, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. That gift of ministry is a wonderful thing, and I thank God for the powerful prophetic dimension that's part of our Bible conference. It's a great blessing. Um, I, but I, I remember years ago when, and in the old building, Pastor Mitchell one time in one of our business meetings had a, a bucket of rocks. Some of you remember that and uh, held that bucket of rocks up and said, you know, in the Old Testament, if you uh, spoke for God and you were wrong, they stoned you. And it was, it was cautioning evangelists about be careful about the words you give. I still remember that 30 years later. <laughs> I'm all for gift ministry, but you know, so I, you know what I'll tell you? We've got to keep judgment because sometimes people interpret and say the craziest thing. Somebody told me that uh, they, somebody was uh, giving a prophecy one time, interpreting, and said, Yea, my people, as Noah built the ark. Or, I'm sorry, I, I, no, he didn't say that. He said, My people, yea, as Moses built the ark. Then he stopped and said, I am wrong, saith the Lord. <laughs> Noah built the ark. <laughs> then they, they told me a story about another guy that was giving a prophet, interpreting a prophecy in the middle of it. He sneezed and said, pardon me, my people. <laughs> so sometimes we have to judge stuff like that. The Bible tells us to judge fornication in the church, that we have a responsibility to address issues of immorality, even though that's uncomfortable, uh, and judge that. And sometimes we say to people, we love you enough to tell you you're not coming here for a while. In our ministry, we set standards for ministry. 1 Timothy 3 is the standards of, of what it is to be a pastor, what it is to be a leader in a church, uh, and uh, we judge according to those standards. It doesn't matter that you're likable and friendly and everybody loves you and, and everything else. Uh, we have standards, and we judge according to those standards, and they're immutable. They don't change. We move along. I mean, the very fact that we're here and not in the tent. Thank God for the tent. It was a wonderful, powerful season of our fellowship. But at some point, it's okay. You know, it's like, well, let's build a building. Praise God. You know, when I, Yolanda and I got sent out back in the early 80s, we went to Las Vegas, New Mexico. And back in those days, we would attend six Bible conferences a year. We'd go to two in Gallup 
two in Tucson, two in Prescott. Uh, but at some point, uh, it was like, well, you know, maybe we don't need to have double conferences every year. And, and on we go. When I got saved, we had Friday and Saturday night concert scenes. Uh, and, and what I'm saying to you is that as you move forward, you begin to realize what do we need to do? What do we need to let go of? And how do we keep on moving? Now, this can be challenging to a uh, church people. Because whether we want to admit it or not, we are church people. You know why? Because we love our routine. We get used to things, and anything outside of our routine kind of freaks us out. Amen. You, you just change the curtains on behind your pulpit. I can't hear from God anymore, you know. <laughs> our church hosts a lot of fellowship events, you know. And, and I will say to them, listen, tonight, uh, Pastor Mitchell's preaching. Somebody's preaching. It's going to be packed. You better get her early. And then people walk in from our church, uh, and it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Somebody sitting in my chair. I imagine there are thousands of people. There's probably somebody here that says, I like the tent better. I felt God more in the tent, you know, and I'm here. And we don't need this air conditioning and uh, <laughs> indoor plumbing, you know. Every time the mist would come down, I just felt a wave of the Spirit. <laughs> the truth is that if you and I are going to move forward, there has to be the ability to say, okay, this served its purpose, but we're moving on. And they were able to recognize God was doing something uh, and said, okay, for 17 years, this is what we've been doing. Uh, we're reaching, but you know what? God's doing something. We're going to work with that. Which brings me to my second point here, and that is that we better learn to hang on. There's a time where you have to be willing to let go, but then there's other things you and I have to be willing to hang on to. This is the whole truth. I read about an Englishman named James Howells. He's a techie, a nerd. And back in 2013, he, when the whole Bitcoin phenomenon and cryptocurrency began to emerge, he began to think this might go somewhere. And so he spent some money and he purchased some Bitcoin, anticipating that it would increase in value. The laptop in which he purchased it on, when that laptop began to break down, he took out the hard drive containing uh, that Bitcoin information, stored it in a desk, uh, a couple of years later, he's cleaning his house and he forgets uh, that he put it in that drawer and he threw it away. Today, the Bitcoin uh, that was in that uh, hard drive is worth $127 million. Lesson, be careful what you throw away because you may be throwing away a treasure. The scripture says, hold fast what is good. The issue here is uh, that you and I, in the process of discarding something or thinking something is irrelevant or inapplicable to my nation or my culture or my generation, is you may be letting go of something of great value. The scripture says, hold fast what is good. Literally, it means nail it down. What is implied by that statement is if you don't hang on to it, everything you got, pressures will come against you uh, to let go of it. That you will find that there are treasures and truths and principles that you and I embrace as a fellowship, and now there you are uh, in your nation or your city and your culture, your generation, uh, and uh, there's a pressure now to let go to discard it and not see the value of it and began to think, you know what, uh, this is too restrictive uh, or this is irrelevant. You know what bugs me? I was talking to Pastor Greg Mitchell about this a while back and we were talking about how people, you know, I'm all for new ideas, man. You've got new approaches to outreach. You've got an idea. I'm open. But you know what bothers me? Is when people come up with a new idea and I always preface it with our fellowship is doing it all wrong. So it can't be, well, I've got a new idea, but it's my new idea because you guys are wrong. Or that doesn't work anymore. A couple months ago in Madison, Wisconsin, they were remodeling some apartments. They were going to remove a wall and do an expansion, and so they removed the wall, and guess what? It was a load-bearing wall, and the apartment collapsed. Make sure in building a church what you think is an obstacle isn't really a pillar. 
Make sure that as you're building something for God that you're not uh, uh, thinking, well, I'm going to do it, but, but I'm not going to put this in uh, because, uh, you know, our, our generation doesn't understand that. I want to talk to you about three pillars of our fellowship that I believe are under assault, particularly to the millennial pastor generation. Listen to Acts 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. I want to talk to you about three necessary things. The truth be told, there's probably about 50 necessary things, but I'm going to reduce it down to these three this morning because this is what I feel God's speaking to me about. Number one is that we build our churches on conversion. We grow our churches by converts. That is why we give an altar call after every service because we are contending for uh, conversions. The Bible says that the letter simply basically said, you know, yeah, I've read a lot of commentaries and all this stuff approaching the sermon and they're, they're breaking down the blood and the strangled things. Hey, do me a favor, don't drink blood. How about we all agree on that one? <laughs> but, but if you really want to reduce it down to it, he says, don't fornicate and don't, let you, don't continue to be an idol, an idolater. In other words, repent. That's what the real issue here is repent. Don't just tell people they can come love the Lord and live the lifestyle they've still been living. There has to be a genuine conversion. Genuine converts are transformed. That is what you and I contend for. And you say, oh, Pastor, everybody knows that. You'd be surprised. You know, back in the 80s and 90s when the whole mega church mindset began to invade uh, Christianity here in America, there was a term that they used, uh, and it was called seeker-friendly. Seeker-friendly simply meant compromise. Seeker-friendly simply meant uh, we want Joe and Susie Sinner to come to our church, um, and we're going to go out of our way to not offend them not to be too confrontational um, and just kind of make them feel warm and fuzzy and say, hmm, I think I'll come try this again and have them come uh, and, uh, and we're going to have, you know, uh, Donald Duck in our nursery uh, and we're going to have a, a nice song service um, and uh, TED Talk preaching uh, and uh, we're just going to do things like that and, and, and their people will like us enough to want to join our church. I want to tell you that's not my testimony. My testimony is I went to church because somebody said, I'll give you $10 if you go to church <laughs> and buy me dinner. Well, you're a teenager. Though, listen, you want to reach teenagers, that's all you got to do, man. And I want to tell you, I went to church and I got whacked by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Everything about that was, a, was an assault on my senses. I had a bag of marijuana in my sock, um, and I, uh, the, the gospel preaching, this guy named Larry Reed was preaching, uh, and uh, I got confronted with the gospel. Uh, I got offended. I got ne wrestled down. Somebody put a half Nelson, brought me down to the altar. Uh, I lied on my convert card. Uh, I swore I'd never go back. Uh, nine months later, after nine months of blaspheming uh, uh, the church and everything else, I went back uh, and got radically converted by the gospel. You know, I've heard, and I don't, I don't say who or where, but I've heard, you know, you know, baby, you come to church, you got a tie on and suit, you know. I mean, these sinners, man, they come in and they see you with your tie on. You're not going to want to come. You know, so as if, you know, the key to revival is skinny jeans and Spencers, you know, and, uh, and that you got to, you know, look like James Harden, you know. And this, I, this idea that this, well, we got to, you know, you know, you know, people come, we can't, we can't, you know. Are you kidding me? I, the last time I wore a tie before I got saved, when I was three years old, my mother clipped one on me and took me to Catholic Church. All I wore were jeans and T-shirt. I went into the door and I got saved back then and Pastor Warner would wear these ties and a thick knot, you know, went to about right here, uh, the brightest colors possible. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it, I remember a week after I got saved, we had a revival with this guy, and I'm not making this up. He wore a green and white checkered pants, uh, green and white checkered vest, and a lime green uh, jacket. He looked like a character from The Wizard of Oz. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, but, but you know what, it didn't, I, I, I can't come here. They're, they're not dressed the way I am, and they don't have tats. I, I, I didn't care. I found Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> 
that it mattered if it wasn't an issue. Uh, I ended up becoming a disciple a couple years later before my wife and I got married. She bought me uh, a maroon, bright maroon suit, uh, amen, uh, and I wore it, amen, in pride. Uh, I didn't care. Here we are today. We're so worried about how we come across to the sinner on the street. You know, yeah, you got the heavy preaching in the big wooden pulpit. That's authority. Absolutely, it's authority. Amen. Uh, as my brother Mark Olson calls it, this sacred desk. But hey, we're so worried. You, you can't have revival with a big pulpit. You know, you got to have a little skinny glass pulpit. You know, you can't be only in the uh, you guys in your uh. I want to tell you to, to the sinners out there, when the Holy Ghost gets hold of their heart, they're, 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 gonna, they're not going to pay attention, they don't care less. But there's a pressure. Some, a lot of, I know that, and it's kind of funny the way this building is set with this people in business class up here and everybody else back there in the economy. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I want to tell you something. To a younger generation, this is a mind battle. This is a struggle. This is this idea that this structure, you know, uh, you know, I'm not, the clothing is it's illustrating something. You know, the other day I was preaching for Pastor Ben Rodriguez and their harvest, tremendous for harvesters. And I'm driving, I'm a block away from Ben's church and somebody has hung a banner advertising their church. You know what they call their church? The Blue Jean Church. I mean, why would you advertise like that? Because in their minds, uh, oh, you can't, you know, it can't be about the preaching. Oh, no, no, it has to be about the blue jeans. I'm waiting for jean Christian Fellowship, you know. <laughs> oh, you can't have services on Sunday night because, you know, we don't want people to come. You know, it's too much, too much. I, I never went to church until I got saved, and then I never stopped going to church 40 years later. If your strategy is to get people to come back because they like you, uh, you're making a huge mistake. You want them to walk out of that building having one thought in their mind, either, wow, I got saved, or, my God, I'm going to hell. That's where converts come from. You want to mess with religious people, God help you. You'd be surprised what people will do when they get converted. You'd be surprised at the radical decisions they will make about their life. How quickly they'll kick their boyfriend out. How quickly they will come to grips when they get converted. If it's not about conversion, but about having a nice church with a nice pastor and, uh, and putting up a nice image, uh, you're going to go crazy with how nutty people are. A pillar, we are contending for conversions. Second pillar is tongues. The scripture says it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit. This was a spiritual work. We contend for the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That is not just our doctrine, but this must be our practice. That means when people walk into our prayer meeting, they hear tongues. I have the privilege of traveling in many places around the world, and, and especially when we go for our own missionaries. Uh, Pastor Schneiderman mentioned uh, Vietnam. Uh, I tell you, there's nothing like walking uh, up all those steps in Vietnam and walking into and hearing a bunch of Vietnamese speaking in tongues like you're in Prescott, Arizona. Amen. <laughs> that is what we contend for. That is what we're fighting for. I, I, I gave them the headline from uh, uh, Christianity Today. I, I hope they, they have that. Uh, I'm not sure if they've got that. They're looking for it right now. But I'll read, uh, I'll read it to you. Headline from Christianity Today, Assemblies of God Surge, but Speaking in Tongues Slumps. How do you grow a church where you have a movement that's growing, but less tongues? What you and I are all about is having a dimension of God way beyond ourselves. You know, we're building a building there in San Antonio. I've only been asked that question Oh, maybe 5,000 times this week, how it's going. I think I decide I'm just going to issue a public release and not have to answer that question anymore. But what is interesting is as we were looking at church designs and everything else, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see if we went to visit churches and the, the, the whole look is making chill buildings mystical. It's dark, 
song services, they, they turn out the lights and they have a light show and, and they have, they, they release, you know, the, 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 the uh, fog and, and they're looking for that mysticism and then uh, through music try to create a mood. Uh, you know why they do all that? You know why they call that smoke and mirrors? Because it's smoke and mirrors. Because there's no Holy Ghost, that's why. I walked into a building with ugly, ugly uh, uh, lights, uh, uh, everything else. But I want to tell you, I, didn't, I got whacked by the Holy Ghost. Uh, you know why we speak in tongues in worship? Uh, because we're inviting the glory of God into that service. That's why. Every one of us have had well-meaning people come up to us and say, Pastor, I really like your church, uh, and you'd probably get more people if you didn't speak in tongues. We might get more people, but we'll have less God if we speak in tongues. There has to be uh, a conviction uh, inside of us. There was a young man that uh, left our church for a little while, and he came back, and he went to the, the Assembly of God over there. It's the closest thing to a mega church in our area of town, several thousand people. And uh, he's there, and while he's there, uh, they, they, they sing their song, and they, you know, you know in, the, in the religious world, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, this is worship, you know. And so while they're hopping up and down and clapping, uh, and, uh, 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 you know, uh, Darlene's doing her thing, this, this brother, you know, he's from our church, and within, within seconds, the ushers, we don't do that here. Assembly of God. So the Holy Ghost brings a ministering presence into our services that cannot happen any other way. You take that dimension out of anything, I want to tell you, then it's nothing but religious activity. If you don't contend for that, if you're embarrassed about that, if you're like, I'll break to, uh, the news to my church that we're Pentecostal a couple of years down the road. <laughs> this is foundational. This is a pillar. Every one of us that have pioneered and opened our doors in that Sunday morning and a few visitors are there and you do the song service uh, and you say, let's praise God and you know you're going to freak them out. <laughs> but it's a pillar. Cannot be what we are if you don't do this. Amen. Thirdly, there's vision. Our fellowship vision is clear. Mission statement. You know, we have a mission statement. Now, I read one time this guy, you know, I like to read uh, Leadership Magazine sometimes. I, actually, no, it's not true. I used to like to read it. Uh, but... Uh, but this guy talked about how he took his leaders and they went off to some uh, chateau, you know, in Colorado in the mountains to pray about a mission statement. That sounds like a junket to me. But uh, listen, our mission statement is evangelism, discipleship, church planning, and world evangelism. That's true for our entire fellowship. That's what, our, that's what it is right there. We believe in taking the gospel outside the four walls of the church. There must be a, a presence outside the church. There must be a presence outside your church of outreach and evangelism. As your church begins to grow, uh, there better be some young man somewhere on some street corner in your city. There has to be this dimension in your church. Uh, it is discipleship. That as a fellowship, we are committed uh, to not just praying with people at the altar, uh, but seeing them grow and develop as Christians uh, to find the will of God for their lives, um, to challenge them, uh, to get involved in their church, um, to have standards for ministry, uh, because nothing will make a man grow like getting in ministry uh, where he has to abide by standards uh, and be accountable to a leader and is required to do that on a weekly basis. You want men to grow. That's how you make men grow, by the way. To challenge them um, and disciple them. Uh, and once you've released discipleship, you better hold on because you're going to have to start planting churches because those young men won't be able to remain in your church. You will have to begin to launch them um, into the harvest field and then uh, not just plant churches, uh, but work with those churches and help them get to a place of maturity uh, where you have enough churches you can partner together and begin to launch workers around the world. That is our vision. That is what we're aiming for. That's not just one of the things we do. That is what we do. You don't believe me, 
Tomorrow night and Friday night is what gives meaning to everything we're doing this week. And if we don't do that tomorrow night and Friday night, then we've had a bunch of nice words. Everything we do is going somewhere. It is our focus. It is what we do. Well, and this is our challenge. That's why we bring people to conference. That's why we expose them to this. That's why we put them in this arena. They will catch the vision. I'll never forget in January 1980 when uh, Herb and Fred and Ray uh, came to the conference. I didn't come. I was still in school. Uh, and they came back that Friday night. They drove all the way back from Prescott, uh, woke me up at 3 in the morning, uh, and I'd never seen them as lit up. And it's our eyes were open, and they saw the vision. They saw what God uh, was doing. I mean, tell you, that is what you want in your church. That is what you want. You don't want, uh, you know, all these nice programs and, well, you know, uh, I was going on YouTube and I, I like to watch, uh, you know, uh, 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 these guys uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we're not the only ones. That's what they say. Well, I don't know about that, but we're the only ones doing this. I want to tell you, uh, you need, if people catch it, they catch it. I mean, I tell you, when the, this is what lets things loose in your church. Not, uh, well, you know, uh, you know I, I'm trying something new. A lot of times trying something new is I'm trying what other people are doing. You and I are going to have to hang on to these things. Let me close finally and talk about reaching across the aisle, and I'll uh, finish up. And I want to close in this final point and been, go in two directions. First of all, I want to speak to the older pastors. And there's some 60-year-old that says, uh, not, yep, not me, but uh, <laughs> I'm talking about men that have been out a while, and I would call you my peers. The older have to reach out to the younger. There's a difference between being an older brother and an elder brother. There's something in us that has to be burdened for younger pastors and this generation. The whole purpose of this letter, uh, the Bible says, was to bless and help these workers. And it says in verse 31, when they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. You have to pay attention to the next generation. You know, we have a boot camp there in San Antonio. We've been doing it since 94. And uh, this year, it's very interesting that uh, we're always upgrading website, the website, uh, just getting applications. And so this year, there was an online application. Anybody, I guess literally around the world, could go onto our website uh, and, uh, and fill out an application. And if they sent their money in, they were in. And uh, we had that. And in two weeks, we had 370 people sign up, 370 kids sign up, pay. And we had to bring the, the website down because there was just too many people. I spent the next two months uh, telling people that, no, they can't come. And I, and I realized that, you know what, people are worried about the next generation. Somebody's got to pay attention to them. We can have the attitude and let them figure it out. We figured it out. Well, actually, we didn't figure it out. Somebody helped us, as Pastor Lamb so powerfully preached. The spirit of James and these leaders, we want to help these men be fruitful. We want to bring clarity and direction. Our burden is something is happening out in the field, and our job is to facilitate that and help that. And that is the responsibility of the older pastors. It is men that have seen revival. Because if we're not careful, what will happen to us is that we will find ourselves adjudicating moves of God and deciding if we think it's of God or it's not. Let me give you an example. Yolanda and I go to Las Vegas. Uh, there was a great group of people there. And in the spring of 84, we began to see a real revival of young people come in and get saved. Many of them ended up in the ministry. I'll never forget a Wednesday night service as I was uh, thinking about this sermon. What was it here? It's a Wednesday night in the spring of that year. And I remember we had a packed house, probably had 100 people there that night. Uh, 
And, and if you would have walked in, it was lots of high school kids and college kids, college age kids. And they're coming in. I don't remember what I preached. I remember people getting saved and a, a packed altar. And the reason why I remember that is standing at the back where most people are praying uh, was this older man. Now, looking back, he probably was 35, but uh, that was older. And, and he was there, and his, this is what he was doing. His, his, you know, this is what he was doing. He's watching uh, as all these young people are crying out, on their knees praying, people are getting saved. And so I'm eyeballing him, and so as soon as it's over, he makes his way through, and he comes to me, and he starts to tell me everything I'm doing wrong. And probably was doing a few things wrong, man, but he never paused to think, and I don't know the guy, but my guess is he doesn't see that. He doesn't see that anywhere, but he couldn't see what God was doing. He was more like, I don't tell you, when God's moving, man, you better respect that God's doing something. You better say, they they have the ability, God's doing something here. This is challenging everything they had understood up to that point. But they realize God is moving, and you still have to recognize when Aaron's rod is budding. We pray, God, bring revival, pour out your spirit, move in a might. And as God moves and people and some younger men begin to have revival, and we got to be careful that we're not just, our immediate response is, what are you going to do it right? I got a quote. I don't know if the quote showed up here, yes or no here, but I got a quote here that I, I picked up from an old fellowship book. And it's the story where Pastor Mitchell is, oh, hold, on, hold on, don't pay attention to that. Pay attention to me for a second, okay? <laughs> but uh, the ba- let me set it up. This is the story where Pastor Mitchell has been told by Bob French about this Jesus people movement that's taking place in California and these, these uh, song services, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, these concerts, these uh, coffee house scenes. And so he, he decides to go. He hears about a man named Don Madison that's having uh, uh, the coffee house scenes and preaching the gospel. And so here's Pastor Mitchell. He's uh, 40 years old at the time. Uh, he has been raised here in Prescott, uh, which we could probably call conservative, uh, and uh, 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 been in the four square. And he goes into this concert. Now go ahead and put that up. Uh, and look, look at what it says right here. This is, it says, over 100 kids were jammed to the walls with others standing outside. The lights were dimmed and everyone was sitting on the floor. He knew, this is Pastor Mitchell, he knew that he was seeing What he was seeing was outrageous to the religious world, but he felt the hand of God and excitement surged through him. Quote, if Jesus were alive today, he'd have a guitar over his shoulder. He'd be doing exactly what we saw tonight. This will work in Prescott. And you know what? It worked. With all the reference points that he's dealing with, uh, God was moving. And he saw God move. And he said, I can work with this and direct this. And here we are today. He didn't sit there. Look at that. They're doing it all wrong. God help us. I want to turn my attention now to the younger generation. First of all, forgive me for calling you a millennial pastor. I want to say to you, my brother, the young man must embrace the revelation, not just the methods. That if you and I are not careful, we just start looking at, well, the way we do it are methods. What does Prescott, Arizona have to do with the big cities of the world? Or what do uh, uh, people your age uh, who are pastoring in the 70s and 80s uh, have to do with us that are, are pastoring now? That we have to tweak it. If we don't tweak it, things aren't going to work. I'll give you a powerful illustration I came across recently. You know, they, uh, I was reading about uh, uh, Korea, the Korean War. And in the Korean War, what happened was a total surprise. North Korea comes down and surprises and just overruns Seoul and moves on down the peninsula. And it was desperate. 
America wasn't ready for it, and so they needed to get soldiers there in a hurry. And so they contacted Douglas MacArthur, who was there in Japan, and they uh, said, we need to get some of those soldiers that are the occupying force of Japan, and we need to bring them immediately here to fight against uh, the North Koreans. Now, the mindset was at that time was that the American GI was unbeatable. I mean, after all, we had just won World War II, uh, and, uh, and so we're going to get our boys there on Korea, North Koreans, uh, the Asians aren't very good soldiers, and so they expected uh, the um, uh, army to come and just show up, and everything would be fine. But they didn't factor something, and that is that the young men who were the occupiers in Japan were not the young men who fought the war. All the guys who fought the war had rotated back, and deservedly so. These young men came, they go to Japan, which had pacified, they, they just simply surrendered, and they were very, very uh, 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 obedient and servile. And so here were these young American soldiers, they go to Japan, they have American dollars, uh, the economy's depressed, so that automatically made them wealthy. Plus, uh, Japan had lost uh, hundreds of thousands of young men, so there were lots of young women, very few young men. The American GI shows up, he has money, he's, uh, he's there, and th the book says that basically these guys were living in the lap of luxury. They had girlfriends, they had money, they, they rented expensive apartments. We're talking about privates. And then all of a sudden, they're told, listen, uh, we need you to go fight in Korea. And they went to Korea, and they got massacred. And I'll tell you why they got massacred. Because others had gained the dominion, and they were simply enjoying the dominion purchased by other people. That sacrifices uh, had been made, men had hazarded their lives, our scripture says. And they had, and, and had done that, and they just walked in. I went through this a number of years ago. We, we uh, uh, took over, we bought an old uh, building and we remodeled it, you know, it was rather large and very high profile. Uh, and I remember I, I had this uh, a struggle in me because uh, the men that were there in the, uh, the old imperial building in their early days when no, we had no building and, and they had been risen up. Uh, and I began to wonder, are we going to still be able to develop disciples that walk into nice big buildings? What does this do to their mindset? We have a beautiful Bible conference. Men are going to be coming in. This is all they know. They don't know Ruth Street. They don't know Lincoln Street. And if we're not careful, you can find yourself in, you know, uh, you know when I got saved and I was a young man, I talk like an old man now, but I was a young man. We had gone on these invasion teams to Deming, New Mexico. And I was like, whoa, Deming, New Mexico. Today, we got young guys rapping in China and everywhere else. Well, that's good, but you better be careful, bro, because unless you gain your own dominion, you can't live inside somebody else's forever. And I would say in the, in the wonders of live stream, I know I'm talking to pastors in Sierra Leone and Namibia and Kenya, in the UK and New Zealand and Australia, in the Philippines and Malaysia, and there are many young pastors, they're not here. And I would say to you, uh, you're going to have to make up your mind what kind of man of God you're going to be. That the dominion and the things that you enjoy were bought and paid for. They were purchased and sacrificed for. Mark Olson said last night in his offering, or, 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 or I believe it was Mark, somebody said it, uh, that, you know, in the early days of our fellowship, there was a split. Uh, it was painful. There were some battles fought. There were choices that were made. Dominion was gained. And now here we come, and we inherit all this, and now we think we can just pick and choose. You know, well, I like this, and I don't know if we need that. You're going to have to make a choice. Let me give you one last scripture. I have to hurry up and finish. Genesis 26, 18, the Bible tells us a very powerful truth that every generation has to visit. It says, Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Every generation realizes that their father dug some wells. You're a Bible student, you know that with every well Abraham dug was a revelation of God. But as Isaac comes on the scene, he knows those wells are there, but the enemy has done everything he can to keep those wells from being real in Isaac's life. 
That's you, young pastor. The enemy has come and, and filled them up and said, you know, these things, you know they're there, you've read the books and everything. But you know, Isaac made a decision. His decision is I have to redig the same well. And once I've found it, then I need to call it by my father's name. In other words, I want to own this for myself. This is my revelation. This is what I'm doing. This is the, where I'm going, and I just leave you with this question. Uh, here we are, uh, 50 years uh, after Pastor Mitchell arrived, standing in this glorious building. What are we going to look like 25 years from now? What will a fellowship church look like? Will you drive by it on a Sunday night and it's closed? Song leader stands up, you know, with the ripped jeans and or even worse, it'll be a woman. What are we gonna look like? What are our churches going to look like 25 years from now? It's Christianity to say uh, the, the fellowship surges, but tongues slump. That's in your hands, young man. Let's bow our heads.